Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site in Los Angeles, in California. I'm really excited to be talking about all things related to skepticism, all things related to science, all things related to humanism, to biases, and to how to best move forward and prosper collectively. We have Dr. Michael Shermer joining us on the show. Not a simulation. <laughs> That's the real flesh and blood. It's the real flesh and blood. <laughs> I have not uploaded my body and brain into the cloud yet. Yet is the key there, yet. <laughs> and for those that don't know, Michael's background, he's the founder of the Skeptic Society, which has 55,000 members. He's the editor-in-chief of its magazine, Skeptic. He's a 214-time monthly columnist for Scientific American from 2001 until January 2019. And he's a presidential fellow at Chapman University, where he teaches Skepticism 101. He helped found and run, this is an interesting fact, the 3,000-mile transcontinental bicycle race across America. And he did 3,000 feet of elevation just today in how many miles? 40? Yeah, 47 miles, three 40, hours. Yeah. 47 miles, I'm a little three slower hours. than I used to be, but... It's a great way to stay healthy. I can't believe you have so much cycling experience. He's a 15 times author as well with New York Times bestsellers, Why People Believe in Weird Things, The Believing Brain, Why Darwin Matters, The Science of Good and Evil, The Moral Arc, and have, most recently, Heavens on Earth. I'm really excited to dive into depth. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Super pumped. I really think that your work is so <laughs> crucial. We are find ourselves as stewards of earth now over a period of a long time and now more than ever it's important to realize how we've collectively learned as a society and how we've built this up and we've taught children and we've built up this collective knowledge yet the last 500 years specifically have been so crucial due to the scientific revolution and us being able to really layer up this objective truth and I want you to speak about the synthesis of what has happened over these last 500 years in the big history perspective and where we're at now with that current state of humanity. Because as you write in the moral arc, we are, it's arcing in the long term towards a more just world. I think so. And, and another way to come at this, this may be my next book, maybe. Uh, of governing Mars. I'm thinking about calling it governing Mars. I mean, we're about to colonize Mars and no one's talking about, well, what, what kind of government we're gonna have there? What kind of rules and laws and economic systems? Who, who owns the oxygen that's produced and the water? I mean, it's, this is not like Europeans coming to America where there's free air, and free water, free food. And, uh, you know, we're gonna, it's gonna be quite the challenge. And, and in a way, uh, the way to think about that is, well, what have we done here? on earth that worked and what didn't work and what works better than than something else or shades of spectrum of success or lack of success of governance and economics and all that stuff and, and that's what the moral arc is about is you know well well, well things have clearly gotten better um, and you know unless you just want to deny all the progress that's happened over the centuries like the abolition of slavery and the slave trade and capital punishment and torture and the expansion of civil rights and civil liberties and women's rights and gay rights and now animal rights and who knows robot rights might be next um, you know that we've made a lot of progress and you know poverty will be ended by 2030 is the UN projection uh, that's not to say that everybody's going to be wealthy but uh, not being impoverished is a huge huge improvement uh, I mean, who cares about global warming if you don't have three square meals a day to eat, right? So to get people to care about curating the earth into the future in a stable, sustainable way, you got to have food and shelter in the basics of life. So that's kind of what I've been thinking about the last few years and going forward uh, is I think this is probably the most important thing we could do. Whether we go to Mars or not is, is sort of secondary to we should think about what we're going to do if we go there because then that'll focus back on, well, what have we been doing here? Maybe we should do more of that. Like if I was in Venezuela, if I took over Venezuela now, we're talking on the day that there's a huge meltdown there, um, you know, what would I do? You know, if, if, I did, if I wasn't going to be the typical dictator and just stay in power for as long as I possibly can by corruption and bribery and assassination or whatever that's what everybody normally does 
when, in failed states, you know, maybe I'd look to the U.S. Constitution or the British Constitution or the French Constitution or whatever and go, okay, let's take the parts that work that we like. We don't like that tax system. We like this one. We like these kinds of uh, bills of rights, but not those or whatever, and, and, and leave a legacy of, uh, and why are we doing that? Because it worked over here. Let's try it here. So I think that's the best thing. And, we've, and that really is science because it's, it's an experiment. You know, it, 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 people don't think of like political science as a science or economics as the dismal science or whatever. No, no, don't think of it like, think of it like an experiment that's run with results. So we have 50 different states, 50 different state constitutions in the United States. They all have different tax systems, different gun control laws, uh, and, and so forth. Those are experiments. So l let's look at the outcome. Like, okay, these kinds of gun control measures seem to work to reduce gun violence. These don't seem to work so well, so maybe we had to jettison those and try those. And that's, that's the scientific method right there. This is exactly why I love you so much, Michael, because I have also spent a lot of time thinking about how to properly govern Mars. And we, you have? Yeah, oh, wow. I have. I spent oh, my God. a lot okay. of time on right. this. And I'm well, actually. Maybe I'll interview you for my book. <laughs> uh, I also really want to press Elon on some of these questions and as well as the next contenders, because who when we land there, what are like you said, what are these best techniques of civilizational progress that we can bring to Mars so we don't have the same errors, the same hiccups. What are the best constitutional principles, etc.? And <clears throat> one of the things that are important to press is how are we going to collaborate? Are we going there as an Earth, as a unity, or are we going there as separate nations or as separate corporations? Right, and we're gonna right. how are we gonna treat the other colonies that get there when China lands? How will the US behave? Right, will we be helping right. each other with rovers and with water supplies, etc.? Yeah. And <clears throat> etc. So these are very pressing thought experiments, simulations to run in our mind about what is going to happen when we move into uh, uh, interplanetary colonization, which we will absolutely be doing in the next couple of decades. I'm really happy that. that Have you, you read this so book on it. seasteading? Do you know about seasteading? Yes, yeah, seasteading is exciting. This is, uh, I just finished the book because uh, I met the author at a conference recently. And, you know, when I first heard about this through Peter Thiel, I thought, oh, this is just insane. No one's going to do this. But really, now that I see what's going on, th these are experiments more experiments yeah by all means let's do more of this kind of stuff and see what happens that's the best thing we can do because the, the way science progresses is through trial and error so Karl popper famously um, described science uh, the scientific method as conjecture and refutation so you're conjecturing you're just spitballing ideas you're 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 throwing stuff out Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I don't know. You you come up with stuff. You know, uh, screenwriters do this for television shows. They'll sit in a room and, and just throw out a hundred different ideas. Yep. Maybe one or two or three are good. The rest are junk. That's actually the way it is in science. And uh, you know, people that are outside of science, uh, you know, they think you guys are so closed-minded. You can't accept radical new ideas because look, this one was right and this one was right. It's like, dude, you have no idea. There were like ten thousand ideas like that. Most of them are just completely insane, and they're wrong. So we have to be kind of conservative in what we end up embracing as the truth with the small t, because most ideas are. So the only way to do it is you know, open inquiry, free speech, free inquiry, open peer commentary and criticism, debate, disputation. Yes. And from there, it kind of winnows out the stuff that's probably not such great ideas, and you end up with a handful that are better. Yep. <clears throat> and there have actually been some hugely missed opportunities, I'll get to that in a moment, with with for that with seasteading specifically the idea of running these experiments of being able to live in very uh, eco-friendly ocean uh, dwelling communities is very fascinating and it's in international waters it, there's a lot of cool stuff going on with trying these experiments out uh, in governance and in prosperity and then the missed opportunities that i was just speaking about earlier michael is a big advocate for like you just mentioned debate civil discourse on these ideas of running these experiments and i think we had some majorly missed opportunities and we're continuing to miss them because for example rather than google having james Moore and the other leading biologists sociologists scientists in a debate right. about the memo, 
We, right. there was none of that. And so we're missing that. And same thing right now with Peter, James, Helen, and, and the, the foundation of scientific truth being, being we're, we're showing how we can't add errors to the foundation of scientific truth. And again, this needs to be on a national stage, on an international stage, as a debate. Yeah. That's how I wish we would do it. Well, it, it is done. It just needs to be done more. And of all people to reject that, the left was always in support of that very process. So they, they've gone up the deep end with this business of um, you know, hate speech is violence. And, and, and that then expands you know, mission creep. That expands to pretty much anything I don't like, including somebody's theory about gender differences and cognitive abilities or whatever. But if you go online and type, type in pinker comma debate about gender cognitive differences, there's a debate, I forget the woman, another Harvard scientist, and they go at it. You know, what about this study? The, well, this study, well, uh, the, these findings were disputed. Well, why? The methodology. So, and they go back and forth, back and forth. It's, this is how it's done. And then you can judge your, yourself. Uh, but this idea that, you know, we're going to squelch the speech of people we don't like, big mistake. Big mistake. Agreed. And when you know you speaking with joe rogan about this as well have made it have you guys both made it clear that there are some conspiracies which are true and it's very important for us to help pile on the evidence make these scientific hypotheses test them figure out the truth embed that into history and and adequately move forward what you've been teaching about scientific humanism has been very interesting to me to me, I think a lot about how the universe is like code, and we can understand it better with math and with science. And these laws that govern our nature and, our, and even us as humans, that then by understanding it, we can build a better foundation of civilization. So I want you to speak on the importance of scientific humanism as we move forward. Yeah, I think... Um the humanist movement needs to uh, bifurcate a little bit or evolve or something. It, you know, it started really in the early 20th century, mostly uh, leftists and liberals uh, in, a, in a reaction to other political or religious movements. Um, but then, you know, by the time I kind of got into it in the 80s, it was very strongly uh, affiliated with a political movement. And I'm trying to steer it back toward a, a scientific movement uh, because the problem with most such activist or social groups is that they they splinter you know there's this kind of fusion fission so you fuse and grab as many people as you can our like-minded people here we go we have a movement and then it, they start to splinter apart and fission when there's disagreements over ideological differences and then that you see again mission creep with that like you know uh, you know who is the real feminist or the real humanist or the true atheist you know are you a are, are you a militant atheist or are you one of those milk toast atheists practically an agnostic you know we can't have you in our group you know it's like you know dudes we, we have we are few in number we have a you know a tiny little tent here and you want to kick people out big mistake but that happens happened to the Marxists and the socialists and the feminists happened to the objectivists Ayn Rand's movement you know, when she died in 1982, um, the, you know, the famous there was only like a dozen people at her funeral, and ha hardly anybody really cared that you know, that that this legendary figure had died, in, in terms of her following, because she had kicked everybody out as not being pure femi or pure objectivist enough, right down to which movies you went to see, what music you like to listen to, which cigarettes you smoked, or whatever. All this is in the biographies of her. Uh, by people that were on the inside that got kicked out for various sins, right? This is a huge mistake, and all social movements make it. So I don't want the humanist movement to do that or the atheist movement. There was an atheist plus movement, the plus being social justice. What is that? I mean, that sounds good. I'm in favor of social justice, aren't you? Well, what, what, but what does that mean exactly? And then all of a sudden, we're not talking about science and reason and the supernatural and the natural and all that. We're talking about abortion rights or reproductive rights or, or, or whatever. These are political issues, which is fine. But again, we want a bigger tent. What, let's just define ourselves by what we stand for. You know, science and reason and open inquiry and, and so forth. And then, you know, people can differ. They are going to differ. You know, my own family, just, you know, four or five of it, we don't agree on anything. <laughs> well, we do. I mean, there's lots of disagreements about stuff. You know, so you expand that to a social movement, to a, a state, a nation. You ha so the point of a good p governance system is that it's flexible and open 
to disagreements, to move forward, solve problems that keep moving forward. It's a problem solving technology that acknowledges that there's this conjecture and refutation. People are spitballing ideas, boom, 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 and they're going to differ. And that's just the way it's going to be. It's always going to be that way. I feel like we must get out of the us versus them mentality that this is an earth. This has just <laughs> one civilization on it of all plants, animals, and humans. And then we have to do our best to identify these protocols, these resource frameworks that maximize flourishing. And like you said, bring those to the next steps, eradicate malevolence, identify and eradicate malevolence. How, how we best do that needs to go through a process of discourse. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, you write about this uh, a lot in the moral arc. It's really important that people embody the full realization that things have gotten so much damn better. Poverty down, diseases down, baseline of electricity, food, water, education, healthcare up for everyone around the world. And we're bringing it more and more to the developing places faster and faster. They're leapfrogging. There are, there are places in developing countries that are not going through the landline system. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. They're going to just skip that stage. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we're, we really are fighting human nature. I mean, you just saw this. We're taping this right on the heels of this incident in Washington, D.C. with the Native American Vietnam vet and the young 16-year-old Catholic schoolboy uh, there. And, and initially, it was just like a one-minute video clip. And everybody just jumped on this. Uh, you know, like, and took sides and, and, you know, just was outraged, outraged on, you know, social media. And uh, to the point where, like, Kat, Kathy Griffin said, you know, let's dox these, dox these little fuckers and really just destroy them. And the comedian put the picture of that young boy's face up there and said, this is a, the most punchable face I've ever seen, you know, bam, wearing that MAGA hat. And then, you know, like two days later, everybody's like, oh, I'm sorry, I got a, I made a huge mistake. I didn't know that there was another video. More evidence. More evidence. So it's really hard. It's really hard to overcome that. I mean, it, uh, I feel it, you know, when I see something online, it, it, instantly you just know the amygdala is kicking in, the fear response, the anger, you know, the tribalism, and those are the bad guys, and we're the good guys. It's just so natural. Uh, but we have, to, I don't know, we just have to combat it. We just have to, you know, say, put the brakes on, count to 10, let's wait, you know, and act yeah. like journalists, investigative journalists, but even a lot of journalists jumped on it. The Catholic school of that boy, they were going to kick them all out. They, they didn't even wait to see if there was a, other evidence. So that's what we're up against. I mean, it's really scary. Sometimes I feel like we're just rats in a Skinner box and there's a Russian bot, you know, pushing the, the shaping buttons. Like, give him a pellet, give him a pellet, give him electric shock, pellet, electric shock, pellet. <laughs> and I'm just like bouncing around going, uh. You know, and uh, that's what I thought of with the whole Russian hacking of the election. I mean, it, the way it's discussed, it's like we're, we're just autom autom automata walking around, bouncing out like a pinball game, you know, depending on who's pushing us. It's like, what happened to human agency and reason and, uh, and you know, self-control and all that? We need to develop those skills because they're there. This ability to slow down <laughs> and think critically about a variety of sources, about a multivariate way of perceiving things instead of a unidimensional way of perceiving things, to desire nuance in all conversation, to look at someone else in the eyes and realize their humanity, have that emotional intelligence as well, that these principles need to be baked into us adults and our children of the future. Otherwise, discourse will suffer, especially as we move into further into the exponential technology, echo chamber, biases, etc., bots, yep. deep fakes yes. era. I'm worried about the deep fake thing. That, that, that's really looking bad because you could make anybody say anything and it looks pretty close to real now. That's going to shake, shake, shake things up a lot in terms of evidence. What, what constitutes reliable evidence? On a small scale, you know, look, there's Bigfoot or there's the aliens and they, they look pretty good. Uh, you know, we're going to need more than that now. And that's going to be the case with these kinds of incidences where there's marchers or protesters and something happens. And what if somebody put somebody's face on there and you don't know? 
Yeah. Or someone like m myself co that comments publicly a lot on things, I can easily be made to say something I never said. I got my Twitter account hacked a couple of weeks ago. Um, Deepak Chopra is a friend, so he always sends me articles. Uh, well, pretty much every couple of days, he's sending me articles. Most of them are ones that he wrote, wrote but others just in, in, along the lines of what supports his position. Okay, so I get a, a little tweet, you know, hey Michael, I got this great article uh, in which I d talk about you. I'm like, oh, Deepak mentioned me. I got to read this. So I'm, you know, it's early morning. I'm just kind of, uh, you know, the BBC. Oh my God, Deep Deepak wrote something in the BBC about me. You know, just give, just, just type in your tw your Twitter password and open the article. And I'm like. Okay, but uh, uh, then like five minutes later, Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, some of my other friends going, Michael, I think you were hacked. I'm like, oh, oh. So I contact Deepak. He goes, yeah, I was hacked about an hour ago. I'm like, oh, how did I fall for this? This is unbelievable. And then I thought, okay, I, b I better do something about my account because this, whoever this is is probably going to post stuff. Like, you know, it's, it, it, my account is saying something super positive about Richard Spencer and the neo Nazis or something. You know, nothing like that happened. I, I really have no idea why this person did that other than just for the fun of it. But that's the world we're heading in. And, you know, I'm pretty savvy about these sorts of things, not to get fooled by scams and cons and stuff because you know, it is what I do. And yet, Boom, I just fell right for it. You know, I feel like a complete idiot, but there it is. And so, and the uh, people I've interviewed about this, uh, security, internet security experts, they tell me is, you know, everybody falls for these, uh, not, not everybody, but you know, it's pretty easy to fall for that. And I got lucky, it didn't cost me anything, but I could see now how easy it is to manipulate social media. It's, it's gonna get worse, probably, I think. We need to grow up we, we need to grow up our own morality first, our own intelligence in critical thinking and reasoning and conversation. We need, to, we, need to, we need to start feeling, like we were saying earlier, with emotional intelligence as well. That sort of human-centric, heart-centric, unity-centric perspective will enable us to continue the moral arc forward through this mess of exponential technology, as well as through the, the good things that exponential technology is going to bring. Okay. I think norms, social norms, are a big factor. It, they're not law, so it's not top down, it's bottom up, uh, of just the way we talk to each other, the language we use, what's acceptable or unacceptable. The social media and the online community, it's still pretty early and, and we don't have a lot of good norms set up yet, you know, and all the social media companies are scrambling to figure out how to regulate their own business before the government starts doing it because it's, it's going to happen pretty soon. So what kind of norms do you set of acceptable language? You know, we're, we're seeing people get kicked off of Twitter and Facebook and Instagram now because they use the N-word, say. Okay, that's kind of an obvious low-hanging fruit one. But what other things can I not call somebody or use as an adjective? Because that's going to expand. And, uh, you know, when you see someone like, you know, Ben Shapiro is an anti-Semite, it's like, what? You know, he's Jewish, right? I mean, you just, you know, or, or this person or that person is a, is a neo-Nazi or a Nazi, or it's like, no, they're not. I mean, what, are you insane? That word has no meaning anymore. So I think if, if, we, if we up the norms to say, just stop doing that, you can't do that anymore, stop it. Either the person gets kicked off or better, just shamed or people don't uh, uh, retweet their, or, or pass along their articles or whatever. And that's, I think, how social and moral change happens, more than top-down laws. You need laws, you can't discriminate, you can't slave people, whatever. But, it, it, but you really want to change the hearts and minds of people. That happens from the bottom up through, through norms, what's acceptable and not. Yeah. Dawkins makes the point that you can identify a novel almost down to the decade when it was written just by the language, at least in English, uh, mm -hmm. of how the author talks about uh, women, and Jews and blacks, minorities, any you know, just the way people are taught, described. Yeah. And it's like, wow, you would never use that language today. That's right. But that was acceptable in the 1920s, and then it started to shift by the 40s, and you kind of see the language change. That's where it really happens. Yeah, that's actually being able to see the evolution of ethics, of the human ethics. And we need to be very careful as well as we move forward to not be so outraged as to dig back 10 years into people's histories and just try and, and shame them rather than, I, rather than have a discourse with them and see that, oh, they've evolved past where they were 10 years ago. 
Uh, the guy that was going to do the, um, uh, the Academy Awards. What was his name? Kev, uh, Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. Yeah. I mean, I mean, how many times does the poor guy have to apologize before he's let back in? I mean, so uh, that's another worrisome thing. The point doesn't seem to be justice, and let's correct things and uh, error correction. It seems to be we want to destroy lives. That's really scary yeah. because once it turns on, you may be into it yourself, but once it turns on you. And that's the fear. You know, once you have the apparatus set up that we can destroy the bad people's lives, then then it'll expand to get you know everybody else, including you. That's very dangerous. You also identify that the rise of democracy has been so critical for us that that has also caused people to see that voting is a is a sport that everyone participates in, and that as we add new protocols trust-based protocols moving forward, it can make it even easier for us to participate in all helping make decisions. Also that the premise of, of everyone being treated equally and having an equality of opportunity for people to pursue whatever brings the most meaning and actualization in life is really important. That's one of the most fundamental things that we care about helping people understand and incorporate into their lives. And science has been sort of the best tool that we've had in the last several hundred years to build up on this foundation of maximizing prosperity. And now, and in many ways, it's having issues with the foundation. And we've been targeting some of these issues um, as we've been talking. And Really, it's the science of morality that speaks to how to maximize both an individual's flourishing and the collective's flourishing. Teach us a bit yeah. more about that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, going forward, it says this is kind of the big, big picture question. Um, yeah, I do want to steel man the arguments on the other side for a moment. That is, um, like I, I saw a, a, a short clip from an interview Martin Luther King gave 1967, which the interviewer was saying, well, why can't the blacks pull themselves up by their bootstraps like the Irish did and the Chinese did and the Germans did and the Italians did and the Poles did? And you see all those, you know, Polish American, German American, Italian American communities in New York City. There were little gangs essentially, but then they, you know, it got inculcated the American way and now we don't think of them as hyphenated Americans anymore. They did it. The Jews, they were uh, oppressed. Well, how come the blacks can't do it? He made the point. Well, none of them were brought here against their will and, and enslaved for centuries. And the Jim Crow laws and so on and for, so forth that he was then fighting. So I have to say that even though as a kind of classical liberal, a libertarian, I tend not to like big government programs to uh, pull people up because it's kind of condescending to them. Like you can't make it without our handout. Um, and those programs tend to grow and big and then there's a lot of corruption and, uh, and abuse of the system. I don't like that. But, you know, President Johnson's point, you can't bring a man to the start line of a rate. You know, I'm an athlete. <laughs> you know, and they've had no training at all. They had no practice. They just put them on there and say, go, you're free to compete against all these other athletes that are professionals and trained and had all these opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's not actually fair. So when we say we definitely don't want e equality of outcome, because that's, that, that's a failed experiment. But equality of opportunity has a little bit of a hitch that th not everybody uh, has the same backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think you know, we have a moral obligation to help people, train them, get them up to the starting line. Yes. How that's done, you know, through private uh, nonprofits or through government agents, you know, that's a debatable point. But Education of <clears throat> the children into the world. Yeah. yeah. Jonathan Haidt makes this point, uh, he and um, Greg Lukianoff in their book, The Coddling of the American Mind, they have an example of the, the U.S. Army in the 50s, I think it was, decided we're going to integrate the Army now. Uh, and blacks will have all the opportunities whites have. Uh, but they, they were not doing as well. Uh, the integration system was not working. Why? Because the blacks could simply not compete uh, in the tasks that they had to do. Why? Because they had such crappy educations as children. So the army said, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get them up to snuff here through extra trading and work," and sure enough, they did. And then 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 the the the, the opportunities were open, and and much more equality equality of opportunity was really there. So that's a good example that it can be done, whether bottom up, top down, whatever, can be done. 
so I think we do, you know, we have a ways to go in terms of the moral arc, we have a ways to go of that. I just wrote an article for Colette on uh, the role of luck in how lives turn out. You know, it's, it's much bigger than you think if, if you have to expand the idea of what you mean by luck. So it's not just, you know, I got lucky and I met you today and, for, and through you I meet some producer and next thing I know I have my own t hit TV show on NBC or something like that. I said, boy, that was luck. But, but, but not just that, just that, you know, I was born white, middle class. My parents sent me, well, I went to public schools, but they were nice public schools. And, and my parents helped me out with my college tuition at Pepperdine, for example. And, and, and also my parents were, uh, had a lot of energy and intelligence and were hardworking. Now, they didn't go to college at all, but, but I inherited those characteristics from them genetically and socially, environmentally, in the home. And so I got to thinking about that, because in terms of checking your privilege, well, that I have to say that I was pretty lucky in that sense, because when I see people that, like, poor black kids born to a single mom in the ghetto, you know, and say, go out and make yourself what you want, it's America. Yeah, well, this poor kid is probably not even thinking of, you know, taking the SATs and then going to Harvard and then getting, you know, the, this doesn't even enter their mind because they don't have that cultural background or those inherited personality traits, you know, and so on. And so, the basic needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot there. We, we should be empathetic to those, the liberal arguments there. We should steel man those and, and acknowledge, yes, those are actually really good points. Uh, I think maybe you go too far in the Agreed. affirmative action. It, you know, enough is enough now. You know, now we're discriminating against Asians at Harvard or whatever. Okay, this isn't right. Uh, but for sure, the program you know started with you know good intent because that the, 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 those things are true uh, about the different backgrounds. That's a really important point, and we're actually <clears throat> seeing uh, the largest. <sighs> As we're hockey sticking in population and, the, and capitalism is evolving, we're seeing more and more maximization of shareholder values. And then we're realizing, whoa, 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 actually we need to do a, a new model of, of a moral corporation, one that does help shareholders, but also helps not only the employees of that corporation, but also uh, provides benefits to the rest of society to want to help them raise that baseline. So this is that next evolution. And, we're now seeing more and more people, Mark Benioff, step forward and talk about solving the inequality issues and actually make progress there. And then Gates and Buffett and Dalio yeah, have all stepped yeah. forward and said, we've benefited greatly from this. We want to help address how to do a capitalism 2.0. What's our next step here? And that's very exciting. Yeah, this is an example, I think, of bottom-up norm shifting rather than top-down, say, taxing the rich. That's such a kind of a 19th, 20th century way of thinking of how we can help people that need help. Well, just take the rich, successful people and just take as much of their money as you can above you know, a million a year, 10 million a year, whatever it is. Um, how about we shift the norms such that all billionaires want to give away at least 50% of their money? Well, they've kind of done this themselves. They have this sort of club. There's that, I think, fortune. The giving pledge. Y yeah, the giving pledge. Uh, and. Okay, so if you're not a member of that club, you're like, well, I better, I better, I want to get a member of that club. Look how much attention they're getting and recognition, and that feels good. And, and well, heck, five million, five billion is going to be enough for me, and my kids. I can give the other five billion away, something like that. So that actually is more effective because when it's their money, someone like Gates, especially, uh, you know, he's a scientist uh, thinking about, well, what's the, if, what, what can I get for every dollar, you know, in terms of the the outcome. Like how many lives am I saving through potable water and vitamins and uh, vaccinations and yeah. mosquito nets and things like that is unbelievably more effective than just say, you know, tax the rich and then we'll put it in the government coffers and hope there's not too much corruption there. Yeah. Well, you know, we know historically what happens with that. So I, I like the new techniques better. Yeah, there is no better way to evolve one's own spiritual presence on the planet once they reach that billionaire threshold than to help other people. Um, even when you only have basic needs met, it still brings you so much pleasure, light, happiness to help other people. Um, okay, I want to talk about how science's mission is protopia. This is very interesting, um, how uh, incremental progress towards improvement rather than perfection is this premise that we want to build on. And I want to know how exactly we 
do that because we just mentioned all these, you know, billionaires, yada, yada. There's, I believe, 3,000 or so of them on the planet, 2,000 ish. And so, do we enable the world leaders that are currently at Davos in Switzerland? Do we currently at the World Economic Forum? Do we let them guide the future of civilization? Do, how do we enable 7.7 billion people to have a say in what happens on the planet? Is that the best way? Yeah, for sure. And I think, uh, I think the internet, social media, all these uh, uh, avenues that are opening up to everybody, you know, it's just a matter of years before everyone on the planet has a cell phone access to uh, Wikipedia, for example, and pretty much access to all human knowledge for free instantly. You know, we're pretty getting pretty close to that. That's more empowering than anything else you could do. Uh, once you've particularly ended poverty and where they can actually have a cell phone, three square meals a day, a roof over their head, and so on, those basics uh, that people like Gates are working on. How to give them a voice? Well, democracy is better than autocracy and theocracies and so on. What kind of democracy you want, you can play with that, but uh, the, just the people having a voice where there has to be checks and balances against the corruption like in v Venezuela now, um, but th that's the only way to do it. And I don't know of another way. Um, you know, anarcho-capitalist friends of mine tell me, oh, just get rid of all government and just everyone will have their own voice, everyone's a citizen of the globe and so on. You know, you don't have to dig very far into history to see what happens with failed states. I was just, um, I just read uh, Rachel Kleinfeld's book, A Savage Order, A Savage Order. And I had her on my podcast and, uh, you know, she has a dozen examples in this book of what happens when states fail, when the, when the government, the central authority, the police, the military, when they're gone and it's not good. <laughs> you know, yes, new order does spontaneously erupt from the bottom up. They're called gangs and mafia and they impose order for sure but it's a savage order it's an order that is accompanied with violence and and increased homicide rates and corruption and there was a story in the LA Times yesterday about uh, the uh, trial of El Chapo going on now in New York City and I had no idea almost nobody did how many billions of dollars this I mean don't think of this guy as a drug lord or a thug or a thief or something he's more like a captain of industry essentially in charge of a multi-billion dollar international corporation. Yeah. That's really the way to think about it. But instead of investing in lawyers and research and development teams and things like this, he's invest, you know, investing in, in assassins and bribery and, and you know, he gave the president of Mexico a hundred million dollar bribe. You know, and how much money uh, he spent as having people assassinated. Okay, so where there's not a free market, there's a black market, and the black market is, is very ugly. So you need some regulation, some law and order. The, the people, most of the people don't want to cheat, they don't want to assassinate, they don't want to bribe, they want to be good. Uh, just like athletes don't want to dope and, and use drugs, most of them don't. But the moment somebody else, you think somebody else is, then you kind of have to, and like in, in Georgia, Republic of Georgia, Rachel talks about this, you know, is, it's almost like if you're not in on the corruption, you're a sucker because everybody's in on the, the corrupt system. And if you're trying to play by the rules, ha ha, sucker, you know, and it's like, OK, we don't want that. Yeah. Right. So uh, the seasteading thing will be interesting to see, you know, if this develops what kind of law and order they're going to have because you got to have some. So, you know, to your point, well, you know, empowering people, you got to have you know, property rights, a banking system, a stable political economic system. You got to have people that are running the, the regulation, regulatory agencies that are trustworthy. Trust is huge. Yeah, those were all really good points. And this is a huge part about designing our future. Now, I want to talk on the cognitive biases. I want to talk about the foundation of science. There's a lot that it has been that we've been struggling with. In terms of, it's really difficult to do things like replicate studies, especially in really nuanced biology or physics or wherever, chemistry, and that makes it difficult to understand if that science study on neuroscience can be replicated. Then there's all of the, then we have what happened with Peter, James, and Helen with you know, with manipulating gender and fat studies and still seeing those be published. Right. And then we, and then we also see this, you speak a lot about this, 
the subjective experiences, that people claim that they have had some sort of interaction with some sort of, of, of a metaphysical, supernatural uh, experiences, but that is a subjective experience and that we need to scientifically figure out how to probe that to, to replicate these. So we speak on that foundation of science and how we're dealing with all of these accidental ways of corrupting it. Yeah, well, it's all data. It's all a way of, of uh, kind of trying to answer questions about the world. Uh, most of us think of science as, you know, physicists or biologists or whatever. But as I said, you know, economists, po political scientists, and so on, they're running experiments. In the real world, we can't manipulate variables. You can't have one country be an autocracy for five years and, and the one next to it be a democracy and see what happens. But that does happen naturally, like North and South Korea uh, is, a, is a prime example. You can see the difference from space. Uh, one's lit up and uh, uh, alive and active and they have a high per capita GDP. They're four inches taller on average than North Koreans. Um, they live, I think it's like 10 years longer. Uh, and all this is just gets, gets down to diet and money and just the basics of life. Delivered by a democracy better than an autocracy or dictatorship. Uh, so there, again, we just, just think of those as experiments. And, you know, the... The grievance studies papers hoax, you know, I support that uh, as I did with Pete's and James's previous, uh, the, 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 the penis is a construct hoax. Uh, the conceptual penis, is, it's a concept. Uh, because it's, it's a way of it's sort of checking the checkers. It's a you know, sort of an internal regulatory system or method of seeing if the people that are peer reviewing are paying attention or if the whole system is such that you can't tell the difference between a real and fake paper. So at the time that the conceptual penis paper came out, there was another one on um, the uh, uh, feminist glaciology that I was sure was a hoax. I thought, uh, and I wanted to comment on it. I thought, oh boy, I'm gonna this is I'm gonna be made a fool of because uh, it turns out this was a fake. So I actually called the university, University of Oregon, uh, for which the lead uh, author was a, a professor there, and checked with their PR department. And they go, no, no, this, this is real. I'm like, okay, you know, how, I can't tell the difference. When that's the case, then, th then there's, a, there's a problem in the area. But this is just, I think, part of the kind of normal checks and balances that go on in science, just like they do in democracy. Uh, it, 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 although theirs was intentional fraud as a hoax to make a point, uh, wor more subtle and worse is, the, is, is just when the whole field is kind of gone off the rails and there's nobody telling them, you know what, we have no idea what you're talking about. This is insane. Go back to, get back under the, 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 the path here so we have some idea what you're doing. Uh, the problem is the academy is something of a, of a cloistered monks in the ivory towers, you know, and they're, they're siloed off from Re, you know the real world for the most part in part that's it's institutional and structural in the sense that you know you go through k-12 through undergraduate graduate postdoc you get your professorship you've never worked in the real world to see so you know i have academic friends it's you know i don't know anybody that voted for bush or trump it's like really because half the country did you know, you know, like 50, 60 million people voted for, vote Republican, every, no matter who it is. If you don't know one, then you're in a bubble. Yes. <laughs> so this is a problem. You got to get out. Get out a little more. You know, <laughs> go, yeah. go, go out and mingle among the common people. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I think that, that that's an issue. And, and I want to hone in on this. We are... We got to remove the hubris and we got to admit that we are just human animals that we have we're apes We're apes. <laughs> yeah. We have to admit this because then we can realize that we have biases Then we can realize that our pattern detection systems have these biases speak to the pattern detection malfunctions Yeah, so the you know what's come out of cognitive psychology in the last couple of decades starting with the pioneering work of uh, Tversky and Kahneman uh, that, uh, you know, we're not uh, rational calculators, we're not homo economicus, we're not utility maximizers, we're not, you know, Mr. Spock, uh, we're not. And, um, you know, we're, brains are more like lawyers than, than scientists. We just want to win the case for our client. Our client in this case is our beliefs. And so you gather evidence to support what you already believe and you ignore the disconfirming evidence, the confirmation bias or the hindsight bias, self-serving bias. And there's a whole bunch of these now. And, 
And, uh, and now there are training programs being tested, like how can we make people alert to these cognitive biases? So you give students little tasks or you know, uh, uh, you know, teaching tools, like here, here's the top 10 cognitive biases, look out for them here and here and here and here. And they, they, they learn to do it, they're pretty good, in other people. <laughs> but then now there's one. Uh, it, it's so it's called the um, what, what what is it the uh, height? No, no, it's the oh I forget. It's a bias bias. It's essentially, I can't see it in myself, but I see it much better in your, in other people. Again, you have to have other. You have to engage in other with other people who you who don't agree with you. Yes. Because they're the they're that's the only way to find out if yeah. you know you do have a bias. You're not, most of us can't see it. It's really hard to see it in yourself. I mean, when people say, well, what are your biases? I say, if I knew, I would do something about it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure I have them. Totally. <laughs> I mean, I do kind of try to force myself to read op-ed pieces that I know I'm not going to like. You know, some far left or somebody politically or economically different from me. Uh, just because, I, okay, I just got to try to mm -hmm. see if I can articulate their argument. Mm -hmm. So the steel man, I really like this steel man. Yep. as a counter to straw manning. It's really a great idea. It's hard to do. You know, it, it, it went by, uh, in debate circles, going back really centuries or thousands of years, you know, just can you articulate the other person's position in a debate? Yeah. Or like flip a coin, you're gonna be pro-life or pro-choice, you don't even know. You gotta be, come to the debate prepared, you know, it's kind of standard college student debate techniques. It was one of the most important aspects of my development was that debate because you do have to immerse yourself in the opposing perspective. And right. steel manning is so crucial in all our discourse. You gotta be able to sum up the other person's perspective in great nuance and detail where they say, wow, yeah, you did a good job summing up my point. And then <laughs> right. you can break it down, right. or then you can even build it up. Yeah. I think I could make a case for creationism, intelligent design, creationism, pro-life, uh, the Holocaust denier, you know, because I know those, fe those areas pretty well. Um, I can articulate their arguments. I'm not sure I could sell it emotionally because I don't believe it, but I think I could articulate. That's hard to do for most of us. And extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. That's yes, it's a, it's a great fa phrase often attributed to Carl Sagan. It was actually yeah. uh, uh, co coined by a guy named Marcello Truzzi, who was a sociologist of science that was one of the co-founders of the the first skeptic magazine called Skeptical Inquirer, first skeptical magazine in America. Um, and, but basically, it's it's rearticulating Hume's uh, proportionate pr principle of proportionality. You should apportion your confidence in something to the evidence. Lots of evidence, lots of confidence. Not much evidence, not much confidence. So Carl's point, you know, extraordinary claims: aliens have landed. That's an extraordinary claim. You know, uh, you know, something like it's sunny in California today. That's not an extraordinary claim. Don't need a lot of evidence. Just look up. Uh, but you know, aliens, Bigfoot, whatever. Th that, so you got to have a lot of evidence for that. And as we detect patterns, we have to be willing to admit the misses, not just the hits. It's a crucial part of science. I want to ask you about what do you think are these most important aspects of life to critically think about? How do we develop our cognitive faculties for greater critical thinking and teach children that? Well, I mean, that's what we do at Skeptic in part. We have Junior Skeptic for kids, middle school, high school. I teach a course at Chapman University. These are incoming freshmen. They have to take one of these uh, Freshman Foundations courses, Mind Skepticism 101, How to Think Like a Scientist. That's the subtitle. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, so I use all the fun topics from skeptic, like aliens and conspiracy theories and Bigfoot, ghosts, Atlantis. You know, there's hundreds. And uh, but 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 really, if it's a way of teaching how science works, because if Atlantis isn't real or Bigfoot isn't real, how do we know what is real? What do you believe? You know, why do you believe the Big Bang or theory of evolution, but you don't accept the creationist model? Why why not? You know, it's not just because I'm closed-minded or I'm dogmatic. No, there are reasons. Well, what are those reasons? Okay, let's go through that. So, anyway, that's, and, I, and we should take that all the way down to, you know, child, early childhood, just thinking about the world through fun examples. That was, you segued right into that next point that I wanted to ask. And in your 40 years now of professing, you've, how many thousands of students now, 
and Skepticism 101 now in this course, I want to give us a, a synthesis. What have been some of these profound takeaways from you from teaching? Well, again, most people don't come into it thinking, they don't know how to think critically. Even critical thinking is, is kind of a clunky phrase that sounds kind of pedantic, academic-ish, boring. It's better than, you know, in philosophy, like a course in logic. Uh, you know, people's students' eyes just glaze over uh, with some of those things, that, which is why I think some of the fun examples or current, current events are a way to think about that. And, um, you know, so to sort of tap into something they're interested in. I have my students, they all have to do an 18-minute TED Talk. So it sort of forces them to, you know, be able to speak in front of an audience. That's hard to do, but it's good. Uh, and, you know, organize your thoughts into around a single thesis. Just have a point. What's your point? What are you arguing? Have an opinion. They also have to write an opinion editorial for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. We don't submit them, but it, you know, it's yeah, like yeah. as if they're going to do it. And there they have to, you know, in a brief, make their case. You know, point, 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 conclusion. You know. Okay. And you know, sometimes they have them do debates. You know, so you have to pick the other side and argue That's that great. case. Yeah. So anyway, those are all just tools. I'm, I don't know if I know what I'm doing any better than anybody else, but. You know, I think the more of us that do that, and that, and the skeptical movement has grown just astronomically in the past 25 years, uh, and because there's there's an interest in a market for it. People really want to know what is the explanation for firewalking, for example. We had a firewalk right here. Yeah, good. <laughs> back in the 90s. Yeah. You can and, do it at Tony Robbins Unleash yeah, the Power that, Within that, as that's well. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The power of the mind. Well, yeah. no, it's actually physics. But in any case, uh, you know, just just those kind of demos and hands-on. People want to know. Um, I'm very critical of the media. They think the general public is stupid and has a short attention span. Not true. You know, just again, these long form podcasts like what we're doing now or Joe Rogan's show for three hours, people go in depth. And, you know, Joe appeals to, you know, MMA fighter fans, you know, boxing fans, comedy fans, science fans, tech fans, everybody. And, you know, he's millions of people watch his show for three hours, two to three hours. Unbelievable. The TV producers, they're wrong. They got it wrong. They think six minutes is the most you can have. You need two or three people, maybe four or five, screaming at each other. Oh, that's great television. This is terrible television. Those guys are wrong, and they're going to go out of business if they don't yeah. catch on to what's going on in podcasts, uh, for example, where you know the numbers for some of them are bigger than they are, for, way bigger than say Anderson Cooper on CNN. Uh, you know that's the reality. Don't underestimate in people's intelligence, yes. which is why, in part, we got Trump because you know the left made fun of the you know flyover country, the deplorables, all these ignorant fundies and Christians and they're all stupid. No, no, they're not. There's and they're certainly smart enough to know when they're being made fun of. Mm. So Trump in, in a way is a kind of a fuck you pull on, in the voting booth. And that's what we got. So don't do that. And, and I would go as far as to say that it may take several months of retraining people into new careers as we talk about automation and artificial intelligence and the way that we are going to see a lot of the existing uh, job infrastructures disappear new ones of course emerge but it takes a period of multiple months if not years to sometimes retrain people in depth to become designers or engineers etc no question off of that is what would you recommend the parents to teach the children going into the automation age right well that's the, the tension they have now is how much time on a screen per day you know some of the data on this there's not a lot but there's some research on this is summarized in uh, height and and uh, Lukianoff's book coddling of the American mind you know maybe three two to three hours tops per day on a screen that can be used very effectively because there's some great material online. You, uh, I, I rarely watch, like when I'm traveling in a hotel, I never turn the TV on. Uh, and not so much at home except for just fun time with my, my wife watching some fun shows. But most of the th time, the content online is so much better than it is on television. So it's good, but not eight hours a day, <laughs> ten hours a day, six hours a day. That's too much. So, you know, parents are trying to figure that out. Psychologists are studying it now. It looks like two to three hours per day is about max. And that's probably about right for consuming educational material in any case that you're going to absorb and remember. 
Um, yeah, and you know the whole educational system. You know, kids in rows with a instructor at the front with a chalkboard. You know, that's that will eventually, I think, disappear. You know, so it's, it's good to be go to a brick and mortar place where there's other kids your age. I think that's good. Uh, but the, but but the educational structure can we need more experiments. Agreed. And I want to touch on the touch on God. And this is a bit on heavens on earth. Um, the theory of evolution does not imply that there is no God. And I want to see what you have to say about this. Okay. Because God can be so many different definitions. For example, what happened pre-Big Bang. So we, if you do take an evolutionary perspective with a God, one can potentially say that God is all that is. Or that God may be infinity, it may be divinity, it may be all of these consciousness, it could be all of these different things and that everything is rooted with some sort of a consciousness. Yeah, so part of my... And we can scientifically probe that, <laughs> yeah. we can. Totally, well we can certainly talk about it. Here language makes a big difference. Now it's been my privilege to meet a lot of different people like um, you know, Richard Dawkins is a good friend, Deepak Chopra is a good friend, Jordan Peterson is a good friend, now Dawkins is an atheist as am I. You know, and Deepak, you know, Deepak, no, 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 there is a God, Michael, there's a God. Now, any Christian would look at Deepak and read Deepak and go, this guy's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. Uh, or, you know, Jordan Peterson, you know, does he believe in God or not? I have no idea. And I've tried to ask him. Uh, you know, and so a Christian would probably look at Jordan and go, well, I like some of his values, but he doesn't mention Jesus and God enough. Uh, you know, he's, he, does, he doesn't really believe in God. So it depends on what you mean by God. You know, for Deepak, it's like the cosmic consciousness. You know, consciousness is the, I'll use his language, you know, it's the, it, it's the sort of fundamental principle of the whole universe. It's the ground of all being. You can't get underneath it. You know, you drill down into atoms, to subatomic particles, to quarks, to strings. And, and there's consciousness. No, 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 no. It, it's all consciousness. Okay, very Buddhist. Mm -hmm. So, it's part of the problem we have with in science is you, you need to define your terms very carefully. Yes. And when you're talking about things like, well, what was there before the Big Bang? You, you can't even actually ask that question. It, it's a nonsensical question because time began with the Big Bang. There is no before. Before. It's like the analogy used, what's north of the North Pole? You get to the North Pole, go further north. I can't. It's south in every direction. Okay, so at some point we hit a, an epistemological wall. I don't know and you don't either. I saw a bumper sticker, militant agnostic. I don't know and you don't either. You know, and it could be, you know, that the, the, the cosmologists will figure out some, come up with some model. Black holes are very interesting. Black for holes could, could give be, rise yeah. to new universes Correct. and the multiverse of its various. So uh, we can probe and figure out what potentially is pre-Big Bang. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, the theists could always say, yeah, but what's before that? The, th the thing you, you, you just postulated to give the Big Bang, where did that come from? Now, of course, they're going to say God, but then we just say, well, where did God come from? Well, God is that which does not need an, uh, a causal explanation. How about the universe could be that which does not need a causal explanation? Mm. Here, we're now just splitting hairs over yeah, yeah. language. And, you know, we have certain limitations cognitively based on the words we use or the the metaphors we use to try to grasp something that's so difficult to grasp, like string theory. You know, every documentary they always show violins, like that has anything to do with string theory. No, it doesn't, but you know, they're trying to transport the literal meaning of metaphors to transport from one place to another. You know, this, this esoteric, impossible to understand idea of string theory into my brain that understands violins, but not <laughs> that level of physics. So uh, I, think, I think it's, you know, it's just good to keep an open mind, but Again, like with the, the afterlife, I don't know, and I, I, I'm willing to be pleasantly surprised if, you know, when I close my eyes here for the last time I wake up and there's Carl Sagan and Stephen Jay Gould and yeah. there's my friends, my parents, you know, okay. You know, assuming it's not like as Hitch described it, uh, celestial North Korea. You know, we have this dictator that knows everything and controls everything you do. That, that doesn't sound heavenly to me, but if it was something nice, I guess, yeah, I'm totally open to it. But that's different from it's probably true. I can't say that. Uh, I mean, if, if anything, it looks like it's probably not true, but willing to be surprised. And we are, I think, building out the tools that we can better hypothesize on these scenarios, I think.
And another one is the what happens after death, what happens before birth. These are really interesting questions to explore. Where is the seat of consciousness originate? What would you, how would you answer that? Well, I don't have a great explanation for consciousness more than anybody else does because nobody does. But in terms of the hard problem of how, how you get neuron swapping chemicals, it's just chemistry. It's, uh, into doing the kind of thing we can do, this kind of feeling like there's something floating off of that mechanical, physical system that is not physical, you know, in a platonic kind of way. Like, what, do you, what is beauty and truth and a triangle or a perfect circle? Where is that? There is no perfect circle in the physical world. It's, it's an idea, okay? There's no material in the idea. How do ideas actually come into contact with and, and, and with the mechanical system to tweak it. This is Deepak's point. You know, I think a certain thought, it caused my blood pressure to go up. How does that happen? This is just a thought. According to the materialists, it's just neurons swapping chemicals. You know, well, to me, it's a feedback system and your blood pressure goes up or whatever. But in any case, I, I don't have a good explanation. I think it's got to be bottom up. It's going to be neurons firing. It's going to be a complex adaptive system that emerges out of a simpler system like, like economies do, something like that. It's a hard problem. The best argument for cryonics is I'd like to be frozen and come back 500 years to see how all these things turn out. You know, oh, co consciousness, we figured that out in the 22nd century. No problem. Here it is. I'm like, oh, that was, was it. it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the benefits of the exponential technology age is being able to potentially have the generation that's born today be the ones that medical technology outpaces there. Well, yeah, you, the, 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 the takeoff point where the average lifespan increases uh, more than one, uh, one year for every year, and then you get to live forever. I, I'm not, I, I don't buy that argument completely. I, ho I hope it's true. But it's like I, retaining youthful homeostatic capacity your yes, whole life, so you yeah. feel like a 16-year-old your whole life. 16, yeah, I don't know, maybe 25 would be better. <laughs> yeah. More evolved, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah something like that. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, when I listen to people like Ray Kurzweil, read his books and so on, it's very hopeful. I like I like the big thinking, the inspirational, but it often feels like religion to me. I often feel like I'm back in church. We are the chosen people. We are the ones that get to live forever. Are you sure? Because you know they always said that, and they're always wrong. So, you know maybe. But to what to, to that point, I say, look, okay, uh, don't you want to live 500 years? Okay, look, just get me to 90, like without prostate cancer, get me to 100 without Alzheimer's and senility, you know, and then we'll talk, okay? So in other words, protopia, solve little problems one at a time yeah. so that you live longer at a higher quality of life, even if we all hit the wall at 120 or whatever and it's over, at least more of us made it in that upper window there of a quality life. Okay, that, that's pretty good if we could do that. And as you talk to other people about God and all these other nuanced concepts that we aim to have discourse on to build a better world, you, you make this really interesting point that we must retain an extremely high level of skepticism as we look at our especially social feeds with bots and, and, and deep fakes. We retain a really high level of skepticism, but at the same time, we need to retain a high level of openness to new ideas, evidence for these new ideas. This balance is super important. Yeah, Carl Sagan called it the, the burden of skepticism, uh, a lecture he gave here in Pasadena that I went to in 1988 that inspired me to start the magazine and become a professional skeptic, as it were. That is, you have to be open-minded enough to recognize and accept radical new ideas, but not so open-minded that your brains fall out and you believe every crazy thing that comes along. It's hard uh, to find that that balance. It depends on the field, the area, the evidence, and so on. Everyone is different, uh, but that, that's what we want to aim for. Yeah. So I want to now a couple last questions on the way out. We're hockey sticking in terms of population. We're hockey sticking in terms of exponential technology. We've really haven't been at this type of a point in civilization before. What are your thoughts on this inflection point? That we're at. Well, population-wise, uh, uh, I'm not terribly worried because if you follow the curve, 
out, it, it, it sort of plateaus. It stabilizes. Or, it stabilizes around 2050 at about nine, nine and a half. Nine, ten yeah. billion, yeah. Yeah, and so I, at the end of the moral arc, I sort of carried out some calculations of just taking the conservative UN projections. You know, by 2100, we'll be kind of back close to where we are now with much better technology and distribution of food such that everybody will have plenty to eat. Mm -hmm. And then because of social effects of like empowering women and educating women and birth control technologies, Good. family size just naturally goes down, you know, and it's already below replacement level. 2.1 children per parent on average is replacement level. And many, many countries, dozens of Western countries are below that. Yep. Okay, so they're gonna face a birth dearth. <laughs> much, you know, the, the overpopulation problem is, I think, has already been solved. Totally, totally. Just have to just, just, just carry it out but, in but Africa. But out of the 7.7 .7 billion humans that currently are here, and we're going to ramp up to 9 and 10 billion, are we ready for transhumanism? Have we evolved morally and ethically for, are we I, I ready? I think we're on the verge. I think we can get there. Uh, think of these extra couple billion people as brains thinking about how to solve problems. More people working on a problem. More creativity. More yeah. creativity. This is good. More people to buy my books, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, this was Julian Simon's point in his debates with uh, Paul Ehrlich, is that, you know, Ehrlich thinks of people like cattle or animals that have to be dispensed with and get rid of and eliminated and reduced, like, like their disease contagions rats overrunning the system you know I mean, it's, it's a very unhumanistic way of looking at people totally. whereas julian simon you know he was like this you know billions more people thinking and producing and working and living a full life this is really good yeah. and i'm more on the julian simon side and really he's won most of those bets uh, well all the bets i mean ehrlich has been wrong about pretty much everything and yet he's still pounding the drum for overpopulation well go to africa and work on it there because but really, there's no there's no magic to it. Again, if you empower women, you know, give them freedom, economic empowerment, they make family size decisions about reproduction and children, and the tech, birth control technology is available and cheap. It just takes care of itself. Okay, Michael, what would you say is a core driving principle of yours? <laughs> well, I want to know what's true, <laughs> with a small t. Um, and I, you know, I don't like obfuscation and, and bullshit and, you know, I'm just trying to, trying to understand the world myself, uh, and make a little bit of a difference in terms of like pushing the moral arc just a little bit up this idea of protopia. I'm not a utopian thinker. I'm not, never going to run for president or, or, you know, I'm never going to be, you know, a, a world changing, uh, figure like that. But, but that's not where where real change happens anyway. It happens from all of us, just kind of regular folks doing our thing in a way that makes the world slightly better today than it was yesterday, slightly better tomorrow than it is today. Just incremental change, all of us can, that, that's where the real change comes from. Yeah. I love that. And each one of us embodying that is how we can build a better future. I love that. If you could rebuild civilization from scratch, how would you design it? Well, I'm kind of thinking about that because we go to Mars, that's kind of what we're going to do. I think um, the experiments we ran here are pretty good. You, you know, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, Bill of Rights. And I've been rereading the, the Federalist Papers, you know, when, when, you know Madison, Hamilton, and um, all these, Franklin, all these guys were thinking this very question. Here we go. We have an opportunity. What do we do? You know, how much power do we give the state governments versus the federal government? And what about a military? What about police? What about the economic system with trade? What about banking? Do we need a central bank? Or, you know, these are all super hard questions, yeah. and there is no single answer to be found. There's just, you know, just better or worse on a scale of solutions to problems that work or don't work, as measured by you know, just human prosperity, health, longevity, you know, it sounds crude to say we want people to make more money, but money it buys you things. If nothing else, time and security, uh, plus, of course, food and travel and things like that. Uh, you know, so you got to get that right. Um, John Adams famously said, I have to study the science of politics so my children can study the science of whatever, you know, the different fields that he listed so that their children can study poetry and music and art. Mm. 
uh, I think naval architecture was one of the ones he said so that, that their children can study architecture, you know, like the Greek pillars or whatever. And I think that's right. If we don't get it right, um, you know, nothing else will survive. You know, science, art, music, this is all wonderful. But if you don't get the political system right, you don't get those. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in biology and psychology and so on, less interested in economics and politics. But I study it because I feel like I really un I need to understand that because it, it, it kind of precedes all these others. We're not going to get to do those if we don't have the right political economic system. I highly recommend others to dive deep into the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, the Bill of Rights, etc. This is um, a good way to understand the foundation of what we have here that so many even just diving deep into history, into big history, and just looking back thousands of years and, and just trying to look into the eyes of the humans that helped build the houses, hospitals, schools, governments, the resource flows that enabled other people to have increased baselines of yeah. food and water. Just really doing that process can be so humbling and so important. Okay, last, last two here. Are we in a simulation? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Why? No, I've read, the, I've read the arguments and the Bayesian probability arguments, which I think are problematic because we just have, we have no numbers, to, reliable numbers to plug in there. You know, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's just so unlikely it doesn't really pass the you know, reality check. You know, I don't see any like buffering signs or, you know, pixelated uh, skies or whatever. So I think probably not. All right. But you are in, in favor of the universe being math and well yeah i know i know max tagmark and i read his book and some of that's to me it's sliding over into kind of metaphysics and i'm a little out of my league there what do you mean that the universe is mathematical it's like when there's a scene in this a documentary about ray kurzweil he's at the ocean he's watching the waves and, and the producers what are you thinking about he goes uh i think it was it was like a computation you know, the, the, the molecules in the water, they're, they're, those are computational molecules. Like, what is he talking about? What the hell are you talking about? Anyway, I, to me, this is a little, it's fun and interesting. I'm not sure what, to, what the takeaway take is from that. So what if it's mathematical? Okay, uh, now what? Does it produce testable hypotheses that we can decide this is a better model than that one to explain the cosmos or whatever it is you're, you're trying to explain? And I think Max does say it's kind of speculative. And I know math mathematicians and physicists that don't agree with them. And okay, let them hash that out because I'm really way out of my league there. I think an, an easy way maybe to help people with this thought experiment is to run our own simulation once we have the adequate computing power and code to press play on the Big Bang and fast forward 13.8 billion years until this exact moment where we're sitting here having this <laughs> yeah. conversation. We see that and we go, whoa. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Often, you know, when I, when I watch Star Trek with the, you know, the holodeck and, you know, the virtual reality is so real, you can't distinguish between real reality and, and the holodeck virtual reality. But they're always doing fun things like Shakespeare or, 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 or uh, no, no, uh, they do... Um, uh, uh, what's his name uh, Sherlock Holmes or Worf is doing battle games or whatever my fear is that it would all just devolve into a, basically a porn movie that everybody's just having sex all day long in this virtual reality and that's it civilization basically comes to an end because <laughs> we're apes right yeah, yeah. I mean the number one most watched videos ever anywhere is, is pornography <laughs> yeah, it's just staggering. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, really? This is what it's come down to? 21st century, our civilization is pornography. Come on. Is, is our next evolution to make artificial general intelligence? Well, I, again, I, uh, uh, th these big questions, is it going to be a threat to us? Or what? Let's just solve specific problems. Like, how can I get my Tesla to self-drive better than it is now? You know, in the next upgrade that Elon sends out, it's slightly better than it was this upgrade. That's it. Let's like just keep that. going in that direction. You know, we get to the point where I, I punch the thing and I go, navigate LAX, and it drives up on the sidewalk because there's traffic and it mows down pedestrians. You know, this is one of these scenarios. How many times do you think that's going to happen before federal regulators come in and go, Elon, your company is over. We're taking over. 
you can't do this, you know, or whatever they would do, because regulators do that. I'm not worried about those kinds of things. It almost, though, gives us a sense of letting go and surrendering to the fact that our next evolution is to make this artificial general intelligence, and that may feel a little more at ease, potentially. Picker makes the point that it's sort of self-refuting these arguments that you're saying we're going to make an, a computer so smart that it can cure cancer, but it has no idea. It's so dumb that it just kills everybody in the process of curing cancer. Really? I mean, you can't, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. There's, uh, there's more nuance. Okay, well, <laughs> the last question is, Michael, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Well, my wife and my son and my daughter and my family, uh, beyond just you know the personal thing, I, I, I would say what gets me up in the morning every day is just how lucky we are to be alive. I mean, the chances that you and I were even born is astronomically low, and that we get to live in a country where it's relatively safe, I get to eat every day, and, and, and so to me, that's the most beautiful thing. It's just life. It is such a blessing that we're here totally and, and living we could have been born cows in india or something maybe that would be so bad cows in texas that would be bad <laughs> part of me does feel like there's a bigger experiment happening on earth than we may realize and on other rocks orbiting stars around the universe maybe that would be interesting and then we play through these flesh vehicles the game well, this was Sagan's argument for searching for uh, the SETI program, searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. If they're there, it means somebody else made it through this kind of stage we're in, tech, you know, rapid, accelerating technological development with our eight brains. Uh, somehow they got there and did it without nuking themselves, global warming their planet, whatever. Uh, that, that, I have to agree, that would be, that would be good. This has been such a pleasure oh, you're and welcome. an honor. Thank you, Michael. That was thank great. you for coming on to the show. Really appreciate it. Good show. Again, it. another example of you know in-depth, deep dive into important yeah. topics that people like to think about. Yeah, absolutely. And everyone, huge thank you for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love for you to comment below with your thoughts on some of the things we talked about. Let's get the community chatting. Go and talk to other people about what we chatted about. Also, check out Michael's links below in the bio as well. And we are really appreciative of your support, enabling us to do cool things like come out to Los Angeles and talk to great minds like Michael. Join us below as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Go and manifest your destiny into the world. Build the future. We love you so much, and we will see you soon. Peace. <laughs> Very good. That's it. Great. That's good it. Job. Good job.